Hey everyone and welcome back to another F1 Roundup, this time after the Australian Grand Prix weekend brought to you by the brilliant Seedstream F1 app. More on that a bit later. Um, there's an awful lot to get through this weekend, so I'm going to try and flash through as many of the big topics as I can, as many as the big stories that appeared in the Seedstream app over the course of the weekend. For me, I was commentating all weekend for the BBC on Radio 5 Live, so I was across every single lap, every story, and so I'm going to give you my thoughts on some of those now. Um, in no particular order, let's look at the way that the race ended with Carlos Sainz having a wonderful victory. What a turnaround for him after uh, that surgery that he had just two weeks ago. But I think the bigger picture for Carlos Sainz is that he is doing everything he can to give himself the very best shot of a good future career. And he's doing that very well, isn't he? If you're Mercedes, you're looking at Carlos Sainz thinking, this is actually a really good option for us. I think he is developing, still developing, still working incredibly hard behind the scenes and the results are really starting to show. There are a number of weekends now when he has clearly outpaced Charles Leclerc, or at least matched him, on many occasions outpaced him. And I think if you're a, a team, not just Mercedes, but if you're Red Bull, potentially thinking about a post-Max Verstappen era, uh, Carlos has been part of that gang before. Could he be an option to go back there again? Who knows? I mean, these are the kind of conversations that will be happening up and down the pit lane. But the point is, Carlos Sainz is driving those conversations. Fair play and well done to him. Let's look at the way the race ended with George Russell sitting on his side in a car having chased down Fernando Alonso. Lots of controversy around this penalty decision. Alonso received 20 second penalties. Lots of comments within the app about this. People on both sides of the story saying, Yes, it was the right decision. It was dangerous driving from Fernando Alonso, although the result or the decision from the stewards called it potentially dangerous driving, which was kind of curious. Um, lots of people saying ah, it's a ridiculous decision. This was George Russell's fault. He should have been able to deal with the car slowing. He should have been able to manage that situation. Look, the way I look at this was I think it was fair. I think the decision was fair from the stewards. I think the way they communicated it was slightly odd, a very strange departure from their normal kind of language. But Fernando Alonso was trying to do something to defend his position. I think that's absolutely fair enough. But I think he executed it really poorly and in doing so created a potentially dangerous situation, which is what the stewards called it. George Russell should not, having followed Fernando Alonso lap after lap, knowing what is expected of every driver, knowing what they're going to do, knowing what is required to get around this circuit quickly. He should not have to deal with a car slowing dramatically 100 metres earlier than normal. That's the sort of thing that I think you've got a class as potentially dangerous. It's a little bit like a driver trying to defend his position through a corner, but getting it slightly wrong and running wide or overtaking offline because he outbraked himself. He was trying to do the right thing. He was trying to do something that was perfectly acceptable, but executed it badly. And the result of that execution, that poor execution, was that it created a situation that was dangerous. So I personally think that the, uh, the decision was fair from the stewards. Then we come on to, why on earth didn't they throw a red flag when the, uh, when the situation occurred? And this was something I brought up in commentary. Immediately I thought, red flag, red flag, same as George Russell. Not just because there's a car on its side in the middle of the racetrack, but why wouldn't you? And my question on this is, what's the advantage to throwing a virtual safety car? What was the justification behind that decision? Why wouldn't you throw a red flag? Clearly it's safer. It brings everybody to an immediate, very slow pace. The race is over, it's neutralized. There is no competitive advantage, no competitive element to the race the moment that red flag comes out. When you've got a virtual safety car, when there's cars trying to tiptoe around the wreckage, going either side, across grass and over curbs, through gravel, whatever. There's a competitive element to that when you're under virtual safety car conditions. Nobody wants to lose out. I know you've got to run to your Delta, but as we all know, there are situations that can occur where you do lose out by a couple of seconds uh, over the course of, you know, over and above somebody else that might be trying to negotiate that wreckage in a slightly different way. So all the while you keep that competitive element introduced in the race, there is going to be, I mean, these are racing drivers, they're gonna fight for everything they can. I just don't understand what advantage that virtual safety car brought other than trying to get the race finished under a chequered flag. 
we're a lap from the end. I mean, just red flag it, it's over. The race is finished, the result isn't gonna change. And ultimately what should be at the very heart of all of those decisions is driver safety and marshal safety. All the volunteers around these circuits that are trying to look after the drivers and the fans, it's got to be their safety first. So for me, that should have been an immediate red flag. And I hope we learn something from it. We've had a number of incidents in the past, some of them, well, some of them even fatal, very sadly, where occasions of uh, things have occurred where a driver has clattered into a wreckage and caused even more problems. So I hope we analyze it very carefully and I hope we learn something from it as well. Lots of rumors circulating and these rumors were circulating across the Australian Grand Prix weekend that Daniel Ricciardo's future at Red Bull and even in Formula One is in serious doubt and under major pressure. And of course, these rumours start to circulate because of the results that he's getting. It was a disappointing weekend for him off the back of a, a number of other disappointing weekends for him. He hasn't come back into Formula One with the major impact that I think we as fans wanted and certainly not what Red Bull wanted. If they're looking to replace Sergio Perez at some point, and that's another story, Sergio just not doing what the team needed him to do this weekend. On, the, on a weekend when Max disappeared through a technical failure, they didn't have their other car there to pick up the pieces. And that is what the second driver at Red Bull absolutely has to be doing. Now, is that going to be Daniel Ricciardo? It's looking more and more unlikely. And the rumours suggest he could even be replaced by um, Liam Lawson as soon as the Miami Grand Prix. That's one to keep an eye on. Just rumours at this stage, but quite often with these things, there's no smoke without fire. Um, let's talk about Alex Albon and Williams. A dramatic crash in FP1 on Friday, as you well know, meant that the team took the very difficult decision to switch um, chassis, to put Logan Sargent on the sidelines and give his car to uh, Alex Albon. I actually thought it was the right decision. And I know that's really harsh on Logan Sargent. It's an incredibly difficult thing to come to, a different de decision to come to. If you're a Logan Sargent fan, I have no doubt you'll disagree. And there are many reasons to disagree. And I can understand both sides of the argument, but if you're looking at this from a team perspective, and you're looking at it from the perspective of the team principal, you have to make a decision in that scenario, in a season where points are so difficult to come by at that end of the grid, that benefits the team. A decision that is the right one for the organisation. And that was the decision they took. Ultimately, it didn't really quite pay off the points, did it? They didn't end up in that points paying position, but they did give themselves the best shot of doing that. And I think if you look back and you say, well, what if there'd been another couple of retirements and Alex Albon had picked up a point? Would Logan Sargent in the same situation have been in a position to be able to pick up that point had the situation arisen? I suspect by giving the car to Alex Albon, they definitely gave themselves the best opportunity for that. And that was the justification for that decision. The other one that I want to talk about is, of course, Mercedes really still struggling massively and seemingly lost with their car. Questions seemingly arising in a number of stories in the Seed Stream app this week, talking about Toto Wolff's leadership. Now, I don't buy into any of that. I think he's one of the most respected leaders in the sport. I have a lot of time for Toto Wolff, and I don't think we should be questioning his leadership to the degree of should he continue or not. They may well have been difficult decisions or decisions that haven't quite worked out and they may have come from Toto Wolff, but I think to question his long-term leadership is probably a little bit harsh, a little bit rash. I think they're lost with the car and they need to go back to basics and try and somehow figure that out. And it is going to take time. In the meantime, they're going to lose Lewis Hamilton. So it's going to be part of a much bigger rebuilding process from a technical perspective, but also from a, a personnel perspective, from a human perspective, they need to kind of start afresh, maybe looking at this next set of reg regulations in 2026 as a starting point, a new set of building blocks from which they might be able to start be rebuilding and building up a new plan for success to bring back some of those glory days they came so, so used to over the last few years. Okay, just finally, I wanna say thank you to anybody who has, from one of these videos, gone and downloaded the Seedstream Formula One app. Any of you that have been regular users over the last couple of years, we at the app really appreciate all of your contributions. That's from just using it, but also from giving us feedback. So if you have any, uh, you want to try it out, please go and check out the link in the description of this video. Uh, you can search Seedstream on any of the app stores. You'll find it very easily. It's got a green triangle as the logo. And it is, for me, the best place to get all of your Formula One news content. All the videos are put into one simple place for you. So it's really easy to access and to get 
access to the things that I think as a Formula One fan, you really need. I use it every single day. I would love it if you go and check it out and let me know your thoughts. So thank you very much. There is a whole revamp, by the way, of that app coming soon. We're working very hard in the background, using your feedback and based on your feedback to update the app on a regular basis with a major revamp, a major redesign coming your way very soon. I've seen early access to it and I can tell you it looks great. Have a great week, guys, and I will see you after the Japanese Grand Prix.